Ronaldo gives in under any circumstances whatsoever. He gets his head down and he fights and he fights and he fights until the last. And if he's got the right car, he can win. Clearly, as a driver, he has phenomenal talent. When I say talent, I really mean the ability to control a car at very high speed. And, of course, the, the head down in charge, he has a lot of aggression in him. Nigel will go faster than the car. He'll, he'll get in there, and whatever the circumstances, Nigel will put 100% plus into it. We decided as a team in the middle of last year that we needed to do a number of things to make Williams fully competitive in 1991. And uh, we secured the services of a new aerodynamicist, Adrian Newey. And we felt also that we needed a star driver, a true front-ranked superstar who could not only drive uh, to the highest possible standards on the track, but motivate everybody at Williams and everybody at Renault. And uh, that's why we went so hard for Nigel. For Nigel Mansell, 1991 began with a homecoming. Following weeks of secret negotiations, Nigel dramatically reversed his decision to retire from motor racing. After two years with Ferrari, Nigel was returning to his spiritual home in Formula One. That most English of Grand Prix drivers would be renewing his partnership with the most English of Grand Prix teams, Williams. It was with Williams that Nigel had scored his first win in Formula One in 1985. This had been followed by 13 more victories over the next three seasons as he came agonizingly close to winning the World Drivers' Championship in 86 and 87. After the 1990 British Grand Prix, Mansell announced his retirement. The public and the motor racing world were stunned. Over the next three months, the People's Champion received many tempting offers and finally signed a contract with the Williams team in October 1990. It was a relaxed and confident Nigel Mansell that appeared at a pre-season press conference. Oh. Being a very positive person like I am, we obviously went through uh, the syndrome last year of retiring and not retiring. The reason I'm not retiring is because I'm sitting here and because of a certain gentleman over there and uh, the new design of the FW14, with Patrick Head of course. The only thing I will say is that I've never seen a factory so motivated. I've never seen mechanics, from engineers to mechanics to managers, directors, even a certain driver which is not too far away from you incredibly motivated to get the job done this year and um, I think uh, with all that there's a certain amount of enjoyment which has come back to doing the job which perhaps has been missing for a number of years. What will being an Englishman in an English team as opposed to an Englishman in an Italian team mean to you in terms of improved working methods? Um, Communication. Yeah I mean that is uh, you've hit the nail on the head um, because it's everything. I didn't realise what I had missed for two years um, in returning to, to Frank's team, to the Williams team, because there isn't a conversation that's going on around you that you can't eavesdrop on. And you can be part of it, you can actually join in the conversation, you can join in the banter, and um, more important, there isn't anyone that you can't sort of motivate or, or watch what instruction has been given to who to make sure that it is the right instruction. All I can tell you is that uh, everyone's got great expectations for the new car. Um, we have to be a little bit conservative and say that because we are running tight schedules, I won't say late, but we're running very tight schedules, um, we're not going to get much testing in before the first race. I would honestly uh, appeal to everybody not to um, put us or put Williams or my head on the chopping block for the first couple of races. I'd like to have uh, Phoenix and Brazil, shall we say, as wild cards. I think there's no question that we're going to be quick straight out of the box. What I will say is that um, it's to be expected to, that we're going to have some problems somewhere because it's a brand new engine, it's a brand new gearbox, and I know I'm repeating myself, and it's a totally different new car. I think time's right. I think I've done my uh, apprenticeship more than ever before. Um, I've had... Um, I wouldn't say any more, but I've had my fair share of heartaches and disappointments, and I think that uh, this year I'm going into the year uh, in the most positive way that I've, I've gone in recent years, because I'm ready. Two I'm ready. weeks later, on a cold and damp February morning at Silverstone, a new Williams Grand Prix car is unveiled to an eager world's press. <laughs> Andrew Marriott, you're losing more hair. 
Frank Williams, commercial director Sheridan Thin, and technical director Patrick Head radiate confidence for the season ahead. A new aerodynamic shape is the most apparent difference between the new FW14 and its predecessors, while beneath its multicolored skin lurks an improved version of the Renault V10 engine and its most radical feature, a brand new semi-automatic gearbox. After his two years at Ferrari, Nigel has more experience of semi-automatic transmissions than any other Formula One driver. The first laps in the car are cautious, almost tentative, the driver feeling out every nuance of his new steed. Water lying on the track adds a further complication to the driver's task. There is a brief pit stop to check that all systems are functioning correctly. Pressures, temperatures and settings are logged as team and driver begin the delicate process of getting to know the car that will carry their hopes of a world championship win. Back on the track, Mansell, the instinctive charger, comes to the fore and the FW14 begins to fly. An excursion into the quagmire at Club Corner ends the first run of the new machine. The FW14 returns on the end of a tow rope. Despite this minor inconvenience, there are already looks of quiet confidence on the faces of team members concealing the knowledge that here is something special. Well, this morning you, you, you had a spin. Could you tell us about that a little bit? Well, it's more, more down to the track conditions, really. I mean, you probably taking some footage this morning, how bad it was. And uh, with the automatic box, it's a little bit different to the Ferrari one. I changed down a bit too soon and it locked the rear wheels and uh, basically just had a nice little uh, spin and uh, the problem is, as you know, there's been a lot of alterations. We went, I think it was something like about four foot off the circuit, but it was like in quicksand. But the quicksand wasn't sand, it was mud. And it just went... So that caused a little bit of consternation, but uh, no problems. And since then we've done a long run and it's been very reliable. You're really pleased with the gearbox. So does it surprise you that it's, it's gone as smoothly as it has? Yeah, I mean, we've got a few little glitches now, but I mean, we've made uh, tremendous progress, or should I say, Williams have made tremendous progress, because when Ferrari's gearbox came out, we had a job running more than three or four laps together before there was a problem. So uh, I'm, I'm greatly encouraged at uh, how quick uh, we are making the progress which is necessary. How would you characterize the car in, 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 as a difference to the Ferrari to drive? I wouldn't like to at the moment because I think until you put slicks on a car and qualifiers on a car and throw it around the corner and throw it around the circuit, you can't really compare and, you know, we are on wet tyres, we haven't run the car in dry conditions yet, so I think we're being a bit premature if I was to try and judge anything. 
What I will say though is that it gives us every indication that it's going to be a good car. No matter what I say to you now, I mean this day, the 21st of February 1991, let's have reliability this year and we'll pull it off. Reliability will be more important than ever in 1991. For the first time, all points scored by a driver will count towards his final championship score. But reliability is only part of the conundrum. Once a car is sorted and dependable, it must race against the highest quality opposition. Ayrton Senna would be going for his third world title in four years. Teammate Gerhard Berger is still hungry for his first win for McLaren. Alain Prost and the Ferrari have set the pace during winter testing. The race around the streets of Phoenix will be a tough baptism for the new Williams and its equally new gearbox. Phoenix Grand Prix and Senna gets away beautifully on the left. Alain Prost on the right. Watch at the back of the grid. Mansell's coming through well on the left and down Jefferson Avenue into turn one, the right-hander. It's Senna leading. Prost in second place, then it's Mansell, Patrese. Red five, Nigel Mansell, he's being passed by Patrese now. Patrese going on the inside and he's overshot. Patrese has got too much momentum, he couldn't get round the corner. Nigel Mansell has gone through, he didn't hit Patrese. Nigel Mansell from third position in the race. This reminds me of Detroit when Nigel Mansell was driving for Lotus and he pushed his car across the line. Now, for some reason I do not understand, Nigel Mansell is frantically pushing his car backwards. That's the pit lane exit that he's coming up towards. I think he's just trying to get his car out of the way. He's getting a fat lot of help from the marshals, I must say. And so Ayrton Senna wins at Phoenix. Despite the retirement of both cars, the Williams team are encouraged by a competitive showing. Ayrton Senna would have home advantage on the Interlagos circuit near Sao Paulo. Senna gets away well. And it's, uh, well, it's half a second now. That is Mansell spinning. Mansell spins, well, that'll give you an indication of how slippery it is. Mansell, there, he's stopping. Mansell out. Oh! For the second time in two races, Nigel Mansell retires in the Williams. Yes, Ayrton Senna achieves his ambition to win the Brazilian Grand Prix. The Williams cars have again shown promise. Mansell looking a likely winner until gearbox trouble. Brazil was, uh, was pretty fantastic, really. We qualified reasonably well. And uh, my teammate was on the front row. I was on the third spot. Got off to a very good start. <coughs> Excuse me chasing very hard in the uh, early part of the race and it was a good tussle between Ayrton and myself and I felt very confident of possibly even winning the race and then again uh, we had the automatic gearbox doing automatic things like changing gear when it wasn't supposed to and we obviously uh, lost all drive again and we were at the race. Nigel's first European race since his return to Williams comes at Imola in front of the Tifosi who until last year idolized him as a member of the Ferrari team. And it's go, let's see. Nigel Mansell comes out and slots in front of Gerhard Berger, who is passed by Modena. And into the lead goes Riccardo Patrese. And so now it's Ayrton Senna who is going to have to take a faceful of water. So he did, he's out. M Mansell spins. It's happened to Prost, it's happened to Mansell, it's happened to Berger to cross the line and win the San Marino... A disastrous race for Mansell. Senna's third successive win puts the McLaren driver in a strong position in the championship. At the start, uh, I went away in first gear fine and then tried to call for second gear and third gear and no gears again, load of neutrals and everybody was tearing past left and right and it was a very uncomfortable situation. And then lo and behold, uh, I think it was, uh, again, an English driver, uh, Martin Brundle, that uh, decided to try and overtake me in an impossible situation. And uh, just bra basically broke my rear suspension and burst my rear tyre and I was out of the race. I mean, the whole race for me was a complete joke and very disappointing. With three races run, the Williams FW14 has shown promise but Mansell has no championship point to show for his efforts. 
The two weeks between the San Marino and Monaco Grand Prix sees the redoubling of effort by the Williams engineers to make the new gearbox reliable. We knew that the first races were going to be very difficult, although we obviously appeared to be competitive. We did have a major uh, reliability problem. Um, that problem uh, mainly came from the transmission. Monaco is one of Mansell's favourite circuits. If Nigel is to make any sort of championship challenge in 1991, he must score points in this race. It's a long, long time, a two-hour race. Go! And away they go. It's a good start by Stefano Modena. All the rest of them is Senna leading. Modena second, Patrese third. Mansell is in fourth position. Mansell is very much a fighter, and how he's fighting now. He sees a chance of second place. This is lap 63. Could be lining up for Gert the chicane. But that requires some bravery. He is, and Mansell's going down the inside of... The chicane locked his brakes a bit. Nigel Mansell scoring points for the first time this year by finishing in second place. Senna's fourth consecutive win sets a record. Nigel's second place at last opens his championship account, but with Senna 34 points ahead, the task facing the Englishman is enormous. In the Constructors' Championship, Williams move up to third place. The Williams Renaults come into their own during qualifying in Canada. Senna is deposed from his customary pole position by Patrese, with Mansell second on the grid. And it's a superb start by the Williams team. Patrese and Mansell absolutely together into the first left-hander, and then the right. So it's Nigel Mansell leading his teammate Riccardo Patrese with a very sore neck behind him in second place. In third position it's Senna, fourth is Alain Prost, fifth is Berger, sixth is Nelson Piquet. Everybody's got away well and the Williams are on their way. Already there's a bit of a gap. Nothing seems to be deterring Nigel Mansell. He has worked so hard for this. I remember the sensation when he announced that he was retiring from Grand Prix racing after the British Grand Prix last year and then the other sensation when he said he wasn't retiring after all he was going to be driving for Williams and everybody in Britain certainly gave a loud huzzah In the race Mansell and Patrese set the pace Nigel pulling out a big lead but even the super efficient Williams team are powerless to counteract the most diabolical of all forces in motor racing the curse of Murray Walker and He's going to beat Nelson Piquet by some 50 seconds He's He's taking the hairpin very... He's stopping! Nigel Mansell, just a few hundred yards from the flag on the last lap. He's stopping, he's banging his steering wheel in frustration. Something has happened, it looks as though he's out of the race. I got the news on the, from the radio that uh, Mansell is it's slowing down, and I just tried to push again the last lap, but uh, uh, when I saw him, I couldn't believe it. It was very, very good, very lucky. You must feel a bit sorry for Nigel, though. Well, I don't feel sorry nobody. <laughs> Robbed of a certain victory, Nigel's only consolation is that Senna has not added to his championship score either. Yeah, I thought, you know, if we're going to make inroads into the championship, we, we better start winning and winning quickly. And uh, Canada has been good for me before. I've won there before. And uh, we had a great race, really. We did the job in qualifying. Um, we got into the lead virtually straight away and uh, then we built up the best part of a minute in the lead which was quite extraordinary really and then uh, disaster struck on the last corner on the last lap um, what can one say except uh, don't want to dwell on it too much because you'll blow your brains out <laughs> but um, the car just stopped simple as that can you scotch the rumour about you knocking something uh, electrically out that uh, stopped the car? Yeah, well, I mean, these are the people that, you know, when you've done a fantastic drive and you've done everything that's within your powers to do, they have to, when you've had a, a disaster, they have to try and kick you when you're down. And they create these malicious uh, rumours that you know, I accidentally knocked an ignition switch off in the car. And uh, those people who say things like that and the people that print them, 
They are just too pathetic for words. Patrese and Mansell take the first two places on the grid at the Hermanos Rodriguez circuit, which features one of the most daunting corners in motor racing. It is at the high-speed Peralta that Ayrton Senna has a horrifying accident during qualifying. The grid is ready to go and the race is on. It's a good start from the two Williams men. Senna comes sprinting up. It's Patrese leading. No, it's Mansell going through. We Ayrton ran off Senna into the lead and uh, I thought everything was going to plan. We're, we're pulling away a little bit. But then I just couldn't get the car to get up and go on full tanks. And I was having a job to stay in front of Ayrton. And then it was about halfway through, they gave me mixture switch five, which makes another three, four percent richer on the engine. And all of a sudden, the engine just started to get up and go. Fantastic charge, and that's a new lap record. And that is only a tenth of a second slower than Patrese's pole position. So Mansell is absolutely flying. Yes, Patrese must win in Mexico, and Ricardo Patrese crosses the line to win in Mexico. Nigel Mansell finishes second, so that is a brilliant victory for Williams and for Renault. Patrese's win and Nigel's second place are a great boost for the Williams team, and work intensifies on the FW14 as the Grand Prix teams make the long journey back to Europe. Magny Corps is a tight, demanding circuit on which overtaking will be difficult, if not impossible. Unfortunately for Alain Prost, nobody told Nigel Mansell. And Nigel Mansell leads the French Grand Prix on lap 22. He has closed from 2.5 seconds to leadership. Terrific! And uh, making Prost, I'm sure, feel very corner now he really can roll round and win in France now and Nigel Mansell wins the French Grand Prix at the Nevers circuit and Manicor Renault have won in France in a little bit of shock it might sound silly after all these years in Formula One but to get past 16 for an Englishman is is history and I've made history for myself and my country Nigel's first win of 91 takes him closer to Senna in the championship. The victory breaks the record for Grand Prix wins by an English driver previously held by Sterling Moss. Senna's lead in the championship is cut to 25 points. The British Grand Prix has been dominated in recent years by the presence of Nigel Mansell. The British crowd adore him. At Silverstone, his every move is filmed and photographed. The man from whom Nigel has just taken a record is on hand to offer congratulations. What I'm glad of is that the race that he did last week in, in uh, France, I think he did a terrific race. I think his passing, uh, the way he passed uh, Alain Prost was a, was a superb job. And uh, therefore I'm, I'm glad, you know, get him off my back, let him move on to have a go at Jackie and so on. Uh, no, quite seriously, I think, he's, I think he deserves it. It's taken a long time. It's now, what, 30, 35 years or something, and, and uh, I suppose it's time somebody younger came along and got on with it. Two men with 33 Grand Prix wins between them, both heroes of British motor racing. I mean, I just enjoy Silverstone immensely. Um, the crowds, the fans, the people, you know, you're in your own country. I live at Silverstone, as you know, over the Grand Prix weekend, and uh, I mean, it's just, uh, to use the American term, and English really, it's just so outstanding, it's incredible. Silverstone holds some surprises for 1991. In the past year, the track has undergone major alterations. Gone are many of the old, blindingly fast corners to be replaced by bends that put an even greater premium on skill and precision. The Silverstone weekend unfolds with a unique atmosphere on which Nigel thrives. With the majority of the enormous crowd willing him on, Mansell has a huge psychological advantage over his rivals.
And that's pole for Ayrton Senna. Pole position for Nigel Mansell, and I really don't think anybody's going to beat that now. That was a special lap. It was, I mean, a phenomenal lap from, from Nigel. championship lead is now down to 18 points. Yeah, there's no question. I mean, what was so nice is coming off the French Grand Prix, which was very important for Renault, and, and racing and winning in front of President Mitterrand was a very, very important and great psychological boost for Renault. And I think then coming to my home Grand Prix in Silverstone, I mean, I'd, it'd take me seven races to win. And, uh, you know, it was great. And then Silverstone, as I said, and I'll say it again now, I mean, Silverstone's mine. Nigel comes to Hockenheim intent on a third straight win. McLaren have conducted intensive tests in Silverstone in a desperate effort to bridge the performance gap between their car and the Williams FW14. And Mansell's got a flyer! And Berger passes Senna. Gerhard Berger goes up into second place. Senna goes down to third. <laughs> and now he wins here in Germany! Nigel Mansell wins the German Grand Prix, his third Grand Prix in succession, to get 10 World Championship points. The German Grand Prix win completes the first hat-trick of Nigel's career. The three wins have brought him to within eight points of Senna in the World Championship. While in the Constructors' Championship, Williams go ahead by one point. Are cracks appearing in the McLaren facade? I mean, Hockenheim was a bonus because we expected to go there and be competitive, but uh, actually end up winning the race and coming away with maximum points was, uh, was very pleasing. Eastern Europe's only Grand Prix sees the Williams cars curiously off the pace. Intensive development has improved the McLaren, which Senna puts on pole position. He wins from Mansell to stretch his championship lead to 12 points. Yeah, I think Hungary, we just got to accept the fact that, you know, we came away with six points. Um, it was all about qualifying there. We weren't up to speed for whatever reason, and uh, the race was won and lost in the first five seconds of the race. The fast, demanding spa circuit is seemingly made for Mansell and the Williams car. Senna leads, crossed second. Mansell third, Berger fourth. Senna and McLaren pull out all the stops to back pole position, but in the race, Mansell's progress to another win appears unstoppable. Time, PK took 9.9 .9 seconds. Mansell has gained two and a half seconds on his pit stop, and I'm looking to see how it... Now, there is PK, and, and Nigel Mansell rejoins ahead of Sean Alesi, who was in fourth position. And Senna's passed him as well, and he's slowed right down. He's fumbling around in the cockpit. 
and what a shame. Senna's fifth win of the year is a blow to Mansell's championship hopes, but the true Brit is never one to give up when faced with a challenge. The fight will go on. Yeah, I'd like to pinpoint uh, Belgium especially because it was a fabulous race where we actually took the lead in the pits. It was one of the few races whereby um, our crew outstripped the McLaren team by far. We had a very quick turnaround and we came out and we passed Ayrton in the pits, uh, so to speak, because we came out on the track in front and then we just pulled away. And everything was working perfectly to plan and I was really happy with the car and engine performing great. And then we had another electrical failure. Monza is the home of Ferrari, but 1991 has seen the red cars in the doldrums. Many of the tifosi transfer their allegiance to Il Leone. They are not disappointed. But into the retifilio, it is Senna, Mansell, Berger, Patrese, then the two Ferraris, followed by one of the Benettons. Martini has gone ahead of Nelson Piquet. Up to the Ascari, Benz and now to Mansell. Is he going through and taking the lead on this occasion? Yes, he is. Mansell leads in Italy. And I'm going to say that Nigel Mansell has won the Italian Grand Prix. He thinks so. He's waving his hand. He has. Mansell wins and takes the 10 points that goes with it. A magnificent victory. A delighted Williams team. The win revives Nigel's championship challenge. Although Senna's lead is 18 points, he can still be caught and passed. However, Nigel knows as well as anyone that it is an uphill struggle from here. The production of a Grand Prix racing car such as the Williams FW14 draws upon the skills and talents of a large organization of dedicated workers. At the headquarters of Williams Grand Prix Engineering in the heart of rural Oxfordshire is a facility wholly committed to the production of Formula One racing cars. Since 1979, the cars produced here have won over 50 Grand Prix and carried drivers to three World Championship titles. Frank Williams' team is one of the most respected and competitive in the business. <laughs> The 3.5-litre Renault RS3 engine has been under intensive development at Viry Châtillon since 1988. In its 91 spec, it can produce over 700 horsepower. Having designed and built one of the best cars in Grand Prix racing, a top driver is required. I was very much trying to keep contact with Nigel and keep Nigel's enthusiasm for racing, bearing in mind his declared intent to retire and I sketched into him a bit before it was formally approved uh, the idea that it would be splendid to have him with us in 1991. His extreme competitiveness in all areas and his tremendous urge to win and uh, I think also his impatience of any body or any area of the team activity that is less than totally supportive. I'm a very uh, impatient person myself, and I respect and admire impatience in other people. And uh, I think that's one of his uh, most endearing qualities. And he is not prepared to accept anything less than absolute commitment in every area from everybody. And that's what winning is all about. And I'm not an enthusiast for motor racing. I'm an enthusiast for winning. And it's his passion for winning that I can relate to and which I want to support. Nigel is headstrong. He likes to have his own way. Um, the uh, the aura that he has of the fans that he ha has around him may influence his, his, his judgment. But um, if we have any difficulty it's spoken of, I'm not just pretty blunt, he comes to the point. Uh, I come to the point. Sheridan is very good as a pilot handling him, if you like. Um, and any engineering matters, which is the nub of the business, uh, Patrick isn't slow in coming forward and saying, you're right, you're wrong, mate. So it's a pretty straight up relationship. The sheer effort and resources required to prepare a team of cars for a race is mind-boggling. 
the appearance of a Williams FW14 on the grid represents both an enormous financial commitment and also reflects the dedication of the entire staff at Williams in addition to numerous outside suppliers. Like an army on the move, the team packs its equipment in preparation for battle in Portugal. As the cars are transported on the long journey south by road, the team's number one driver and his wife, Roseanne, take off for Lisbon in his private jet. Member 6 November Michael Clearance. Member 1, 6 November Michael have this uh, splendid ship, the airplane that is, uh, wouldn't be able to do my job anymore, mainly because logistics are such that uh, you couldn't get scheduled flights to fly to and from where we need to get to in the time span that we have. The other important thing is the minimizing the amount of hassle that we have. And even this morning, I mean, you haven't heard, but uh, I should tell you now, we've had a two-hour delay this morning just on slot times flying down to uh, Lisbon. But in a nutshell, um, I wouldn't say it helps me prepare, but it gives me a little bit of freedom. I think Spa, um, every race has become mega important because we had that setback in Spa where, while we were leading, we didn't finish. And Ayrton got that extra 10 points, which made a big problem in the championship for me uh, from the standpoint. He's just got a lot of points in ahead now. Monza was absolutely critical from the point of view of staying in the championship race. We just had to win and we had to beat Ayrton, which we did. But unfortunately, uh, he did a great job in coming second and getting another six points. But I mean, this race we're going to this weekend, Estoril is... Uh, more critical now than what Monza was because if we want to stay in the championship race which of course I think we all want to do uh, it just means that we've not only got to beat him but to be realistic we've got to try and win again this weekend so it puts a tremendous amount of pressure on the team and the engineers and, and especially myself too to get the job done and I've now won uh, 17 races with them which I'm very very proud of and um, We've just uh, gelled more so this time now, this last few months than we did even with the four years I was with them before. We believe in each other far more and uh, the personnel and the mechanics, engineers, everybody back at the factory, machinists, you name them, who work at Williams, everybody's pulling in one direction and I think it's the most complete team I've ever seen in the pit lane and actually worked for in Formula One or in motor racing period. What goes through Nigel's head in the 20 seconds before the light turns to green? Well, I mean, I mean, the most important thing is make sure the car's in gear, uh, make sure that you've selected the right gear too, especially when you have an automatic box. Yes, we don't have any feel or sensation with a gear lever. We just have a printout on the dashboard with a light with a number that comes up that says that you're in first, second, third or sixth or whatever it is. So that's very, very important. The other thing is to concentrate very hard that when I'm looking at you now, I mustn't blink my eyes for at least sort of 20 seconds. They are just blink them. If you blink them when the red light comes on and then it goes off, you're that split second slower starting. So you've got to concentrate like crazy to just stare at those lights and when that red light goes out, you've gone. But don't go too quick, otherwise you get a minute penalty. So you're concentrating pretty hard. Estoril is a great racing circuit, it's a driver's circuit. Very, very fast, very demanding, a little bit bumpy. Tremendous, uh, grueling corners. I mean, very, very physical on two corners there. A lot of G-loading. The car's got to be right. If the car isn't right, you're in big trouble. And um, in one word, we've got to go and get the job done this weekend. That wasn't a bad landing, was it? Number one five five pushback. Number one five.
A line of executive jets sits on the Lisbon apron, all belonging to Formula One drivers competing at Estoril. Frank Williams and other Williams personnel arrive shortly after Nigel. The championship is on the line. The Portuguese Grand Prix will be a make or break race. Nothing other than a win will be good enough. As the Grand Prix looms, Nigel escapes the pressure and relaxes with a round of golf, his other great passion. Tomorrow's a very, very important day because uh, the weather looks like it's going to be changing. And uh, if we can, we want to be on the front row tomorrow, ready for the race uh, on Sunday, because uh, Ayrton's going to be pushing very, very hard this weekend. And, uh, you know, it goes without saying that I will too, but uh, Ferrari's got to try and do something quickly because they're falling by the wayside so Alan and jean Lacey will be uh, pushing very hard and of course Ricardo, my teammate, who's uh, I think surprised a lot of people this year. I don't think it surprised me but uh, yeah, he's uh, turning in some real good times in qualifying. In qualifying, Mansell follows his normal routine setting a time and waiting for the opposition to respond. with his regular car and with only five minutes remaining Patrese is forced to use Nigel's spare car which had been hastily modified to suit the other driver and with a scorching lap snatches another pole position in the dying minutes. <laughs> Nigel relieves his frustration by putting on a show back at the golf course. Motor racing is full of surprises, but uh, if I'm showing my disappointment, it's because I am. Because, um, you know, uh, it's got to be said, my teammate did an absolutely outstanding job today, a fantastic job. But, you know, he took the T car, which um, I was advised the better engine was in the other car. And um, I can't say too much because it's a very political situation we find ourselves in with a new engine which is supposed to be better. And I think in time it will be better, but uh, you know the great thing is is that we're racing the RS3, although I shouldn't be telling you that, but by this program comes out it will probably be okay to let you know. Uh, but there is some intrigue with the engines at the moment and uh, they will get it right and the great thing is we'll have the right engine in the car for tomorrow and will be very competitive, but the reason I'm disappointed is not because my teammate's on pole, although it would have been nice to do it the other way around, it's because I'm in fourth. And the McLaren spits, splits Ricardo and myself, and uh, needless to say, Gerhard's not going to make my life easy tomorrow, and Ayrton, obviously, is not going to make it even harder. So it's a heck of a situation for me, and uh, one that we've been in similar before, but uh, I'm not relishing exactly tomorrow. <laughs> I'm going back to the circuit now as I finish talking with yourself and I'm going to eat up the circuit tonight. I'm going to stay with the team and my engineer until the car is completely finished so that I know that the settings we have on the car uh, are going to be exactly as I want for the morning. Uh, we're going to have a game plan on tyres. We've got about three or four sets of tyres we want to run through tomorrow. We've got different aerodynamic settings which are vital for the race tomorrow. The reason they're so vital is as simple as this. I've got to overtake people down the straight. You can't overtake people down the straight if you're not as quick as them down it. So I might possibly have to run less wing than other people tomorrow to be quick down the straight. The only trouble there is, is that although you're quick down the straight, you might be slow around certain corners, so you're trading off all the time. Um, I wish it was easy. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. But. <laughs>
Race day starts at dawn for the Williams mechanics. The hours and minutes tick by. Well, it's race day, of course. Everybody's, I would have to say, very calm and very professional in what they're doing. It's, there's an atmosphere of, obviously, of expectation, and we're all trying to think of the various things that may or may not go wrong and that we can prevent happening uh, prior to the event. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's a time when we've put a lot of work in, because Thursday, Friday, Saturday have been long days for everybody in the team, and now Sunday's coming. And to some extent, Sunday will take care of itself, but we have to make sure we minimise all uh, you know, potential problems. Ricardo was in pole, Nigel is in fourth place. Ergo, two cars to get by. These two cars will make it extremely difficult. Some strategies will apply. A number of non-discussable scenarios um, are possible. And we will try and come up with answers to accommodate those situations. But we are certain that Ricardo's total cooperation to assist Nigel in winning the race, if he's in a position to do so, and of course winning the championship from this race onwards. It's difficult to practice wheel changing, and Sunday's a good time to do it because the car is there ready to be, uh, to be used, and we've got all the crew there, and we practice nose changes, wheel changes, and we practice wheel changes with the guns going down as well. In fact, all four guns going down was one practice we did, which was quite interesting. Um, so again, we're just trying to you know, cover every eventuality. Our morale's terrific. You know, the guys are fantastic. You know, I look down the pit lane, and um, it's difficult to see a better team out there in terms of better, better people and better morale and uh, better individuals. They're a fantastic bunch of guys. Today will be what will be. Come on. We can only do uh, the best job we can. The grid assembles. Excellent start by Patrese. Mansell in third position ahead of Senna, but Senna's got the inside line and he takes it as they go into turn one. Let's have a look and see what's happening. Mansell goes through to second place. Mansell is now eight and a half seconds ahead and he looks as though he's going for, he's in the lead. Nigel Mansell has taken the lead. As Mansell goes for his task stop. So, critical time, no hurry for the Williams team, just essential to have no errors, nothing stuck on and just get him turned round. Ten seconds would do nicely, there is not a hurry on this one. Ten seconds would do. Do not make any mistakes, and it sounds like that is terribly bad luck for Nigel Mansell. Nigel begins an heroic recovery that will take him from 16th place to sixth in 20 laps before he is disqualified. Here. Now, here is a black flag. What we need to see is the number of the car, number five, and that is Mansell being black flagged. Mansell coming in, and I fear that Mansell must have given up now. This is a very, very sad ending to a superb drive. And Ricardo Patrese enters the start and finish straight and crosses the line to win the Portuguese Grand Prix. Even Patrese's victory cannot console the Williams team. Senna's championship lead has now grown to 24 points. And I said that uh, it was going to be a tough race and um, the first five seconds were going to be crucial. 
And that's because I've made up my mind that uh, the easiest way to overtake anybody at this circuit is on the start when we get the jump. And I mean, everything went to plan, um, although I do believe that Ayrton uh, questioned my manoeuvre, um, which is a bit of a shame because I've seen him do far worse. Um, I mean, and you know, it couldn't have been better, could it? I mean, in second place behind my teammate, and I was sitting there conserving my tyres. And then we were pulling away a little bit, and then I started to push my teammate a little bit harder, and uh, basically uh, then he decided, oh, OK, I better pull over, and uh, I blew past him, and then I pulled out a little bit of a lead uh, ready for the pit stop. And then I think, you know, people best judge for themselves exactly what happened, because um, I'm still in a little bit of shock, because it's a fairly routine situation. Um, what can I say really, this is the day after, the morning after, it's only just after 9 o'clock in the morning, I didn't sleep too good last night. People are going to say, well who are you going to blame? Well I can tell you smiling, I'm not going to blame anybody. I think it's one of these times that you got to look into the camera and grin and bear it and say, uh, we're a great team, we're all together and uh, we'll stick with one another and uh, I feel terrible frustration and disappointment, I won't deny that, but my heart goes out to the people involved yesterday because I know how they feel and I know they share how I feel, so uh, I'm not pointing the finger. I shall just say, uh, you know, let's do a little bit better next time. Despite odds stacked heavily against him, Barcelona sees Mansell put on a defiant show. He's got Mansell throwing all over him. He has no reason to stay out. I think the tactic should have been for Senna to go for tyres. It's going to be too late. Wheel to wheel stuff. Look at this. They're almost touching. Mansell gets in there. And Senna back on the inside. The meantime. And right, that's Senna spinning. Senna spins and he's nearly collected. As Mansell goes to the inside. And wheel to wheel stuff. And Mansell got it. And... Uh, Berger really seemed to hang on to that one for a long time. May have been uh, lost a bit less time if he didn't let it go. But Mansell takes the lead and Schumacher is right with him. And out goes the chequered flag and Nigel Mansell wins in Spain. Magnificent. Nigel's never-say-die spirit keeps the championship in doubt. Senna's poor finish means Mansell still has a mathematical chance of the title while Williams hold a one-point lead in the Constructors' Championship with two races to go. Spain, oh, what a weekend. I was, a, I was accused of being a triathlete that weekend, playing football, boxing, and winning a race. <laughs> so it was a bit of a funny weekend, really. But uh, knuckles are just, you know, they're all right now. <laughs> the large and fanatical crowd at Suzuka may see the championship decided, for Nigel, it is a fait accompli. Victory is essential. We can't go anywhere, we can't do anything. Um, actually operating and trying to do our job is very, very difficult at times. But uh, that's sort of the downside. But the upside is, I mean, they are fantastic fans. Yeah, I'm, I'm very tired. I mean, I'll raise my game tomorrow when I have to, but I mean, uh, I'm taking my antibiotics again and uh, it's just been a tough year, and I mean, coming here and working and the pressure and, and everything, it, it just tends to drain you a little bit. Berger gets away well, Senna gets away well, Patrese challenging, and it is Berger, Senna, Mansell in third position, they're round the Mansell third. harrying Ayrton Senna, and off, off, that Mansell, that's him, Mansell out, and the World Championship has been won by Ayrton Senna, and ironically, with a very, very sad Frank Williams looking at the pit lane. Nigel Mansell has gone off in despair at the very corner that claimed Prost and Senna last year. Well, Mansell tried hard, but he is out of the World Championship. I, think I was just relieved to be able to walk away from a 200 mile an hour, uh, you know, uh, shunt basically because uh, deceleration in that gravel sideways I was worried that the car might flip and I went into that corner I had no deceleration at all from the brakes uh, by the time that I was running off the circuit and, I mean that worried me a lot so it was relief from the point of view of being out of the car and in one piece and you know everything working 
And then uh, I'd say that, look, you know, the championship was over in Japan, but it was not lost in Japan. And you must remember there's a big significant difference. You know, the mathematical opportunity of winning the championship went away in Japan, but the championship was not lost in Japan. It was lost at the beginning of the year. It was lost for two reasons. One, the rule changes went from 11 races counting for the championship to all 16 races. So that made it a reliability uh, championship as much as a speed championship. But our problem at the beginning of the year, both for Ricardo and myself, was reliability. I mean, we didn't finish uh, any races for the first three or four. I mean, there's Ayrton got 40 points up on the board, and I got my first points, uh, which was second in Monte Carlo, and I was 34 points before we even started. With the championship pressure off, hopes are high for a battle royal at the 1991 finale. After much deliberation, and against most drivers' wishes, the race goes ahead in appalling conditions. Senna leads Mansell by the a gap that you can see. What about Mansell? He's going through it. He's going up alongside, and that's possibly the reason that you bet that's the Jack Brabham Street. Nigel Mansell has spun out of the Australian Grand Prix. Stop the race. Stop the race, he's saying. Red flag is out. Red flag out. Red flag on the start finish line, so the race has been stopped. Nigel Mansell being helped into the medical wagon. A deflating end to a superb year of World Championship Grand Prix racing. Despite sliding into a barrier, Mansell is placed second in what turned out to be the shortest ever Grand Prix, just 14 laps, bringing down the curtain on his 1991 season. Nigel's second place in the championship is the product of sheer determination. Williams Renault finished second in the Constructors' Championship, having provided McLaren with the strongest challenge to their supremacy in years. Well, I have to say that we haven't set down at the beginning of the ocean, right? I think we might win six or eight. That's fine sky as far as I'm concerned. I'm very happy surprised with the performance, almost as, indeed the superior performance for most of the time, of the car that Patrick had made and knew he'd come up with. It's a certain outstanding motor car. And that makes life easy. The engine's extremely competitive. I'm happily surprised, but I did not sit down with anybody else in India and say, well, we should, these are our, well, yes, these are our targets, but how we achieve them, only time will tell. I think it's one of the, the best years I've had, and I think the reason for that, and, and the reason I can sit here and sort of even smile a little bit, is that uh, I came back for the right reasons. Uh, Williams offered me a package to try and go for the championship, and I think we've proved to the world that uh, we stayed in Formula One motor racing uh, to try and achieve exactly that. And that's why I don't reproach any particular sponsor or manufacturer or any team member because Williams' team is a fantastic team because they are a team. Everybody pulls together. And I think what Renault has tr tried to do and ELF and the Williams team this year has, has been magnificent. And I think no one should even sort of look at any kind of negative situation this year. They should actually give a, give a lot of praise to the Williams team and Renault because without them this year, it would have been one hell of a boring championship. I can only apologise that we didn't crack it this year, but you watch the Williams team in 1992 because you never know, next year should be the year. The 1991 World Drivers' Championship will be remembered for the great excitement provided by one man. Without Nigel Mansell, the 91 title would have been a formality for Ayrton Senna. Mansell's stirring recovery from a 34-point deficit after four races provided nerve-tingling drama. As the season progressed, Nigel's five victories, including an emotional home win at Silverstone, put the rival McLaren team under intense pressure and carried Mansell to within tantalizing reach of the World Championship crown. Despite the cruelest of luck, which deprived him of at least three further wins, Mansell's dogged refusal to admit defeat kept motor racing fans the world over on the edge of their seats and the championship alive until the penultimate race. With a full year of development behind both car and driver, the 1992 season holds the prospect of being Nigel's greatest opportunity yet to finally win the world title.